Good morning. Good morning. And well, let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for another day and the opportunity to come out. We're so thankful for our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, for the God is him being a being, we wouldn't have the hope of eternal salvation. Father, we pray that you would be with us this morning for those that want to be here to put, those that are traveling, those that are on the medical care, that you would comfort them. Father, we also pray for those that see leadership in this congregation, that they can keep them strong and focused. These are all things we ask you to sign in this morning. Let's get the screen share going for you, Dixon, so we can. Right. I appreciate this opportunity. It's been I guess well over two years since I've taught a class, I have missed it immensely. Uh, of course, I feel like I'm preaching to the choir this morning because uh, y'all have known these scriptures for years in your life, so we'll look at them together. Uh, when Phil asked me to teach and he gave me this chapter, I, and I saw it was on love, I said, you know, I'm going to need at least a quarter to begin teaching love, and then he told me, I didn't have but 30 minutes to do it yet. <laughs> uh, I'll do the best I can. This is an excellent scripture. Perky, can you read uh, this passage for us, please? Yes. Whoever loves his brother, sister, abides in the light, and in, in them there is no cause for stumbling. Okay. So it comes from 1 John chapter number 2, verse number 10. I did modify it slightly to make it more to our understanding, but that's fine. Okay, let's see. Did you turn it off too? No. Let's see. Okay. 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 First one, I'm going to start off as quickly as I can, talking about the definition of love. And uh, really, these are internet definitions, so you can trust them as much as you trust the internet. But, uh, here is uh, what the internet says about love. I'm not going to go through it, but you can see all the different meanings. Then I went to Merriam Webster, and they had this page on the noun verb, this one more page, and then they had one more page for the verb noun, uh, verb love. So you can see the complexity of uh, humanity trying to explain what love is. Uh, here's even more right here. Uh, I guess what I like best of all is the children's definition of love. And this, this hits it on the spot. Love is when you go out to eat and give somebody most of your french fries without making them the cheese. <laughs> <laughs> the next one is love is what makes you smile when you're tired. I don't know how many times we've, we've gone out cleaning up people's yards, uh, looking at the smile on our face when we're through, but they were dead tired. Okay. And love this last one. Love is when my mommy makes coffee for my daddy. She takes a sip before giving it to him. To make sure it is. Okay. That's right on the bar, guys. Okay. So uh, you can see how love is just kind of hit and miss. So what is love? Uh, I'm going to get to the internet to look at what the Greeks use for the concept of love and. Uh, it's interesting, only four of them are referenced in the Bible that I know of, but let's look at all of them. First of all, whoops. Okay, I 
guess uh, this is like a wrong forward spot. I guess I'm going to start with this green. Okay. First of all, if I were to pass out a slip of paper, I would have put a different definition of emission on it. Perhaps. Okay. Uh, uh, if we look at what I personally see as my definition of love, I call it a feeling or an emotion or an attitude or a commitment that prompts some type of action on my part. Okay. Uh, I know that God and Jesus got here, but you said when she first saw her grandchild, it was immediate love. Okay. It was a feeling you didn't have to. We don't explain it, we don't understand it sometimes when I take some particular feeling, but Cucumber salad last night. Oh, uh, <laughs> oh that tasted good. I will make it again. Uh, a coach of attitude. It's things that our culture just kind of instills in us, and we love because it's the thing to do. Uh, the real one, though, here is our commitment. When we accepted Christ and we were transformed, we made a commitment. To love is something we do because it's written to do it. And we love being compelled to do it. It's a sacrifice. Okay. Look at the giant's basic definition of love today. All right. It's used four, seven times in the first John. It's used even more second, third John. It talks about many times. In this passage alone, it's used four times and twice it's referred to what? A new command. Jesus said that uh, as he was ready to go to the cross. Here are some possible meanings again taken from the internet. You can uh, believe them or not, believe them based on that fact. First is eros, and that's just kind of a, a passion or like a a boy and a girl when they meet each other and they fall in love, so to speak. And then a phileo is a friendship where we get our word a Philadelphia, when we say we are brotherly love. I bold it, by the way, the ones that are used in the scriptures. Uh, Luther's was a playful or flirtatious type of love. Uh, it's where we get the word ludicrous. And many times you see young. People in love with each other doing weird stuff. Okay? And that's ludicrous that's going on there. Sturge is an unconditional family type love. They indicated that the, this is where we get our word store, like storekeeping, or storehouse, or family, or storehouse. Don't know uh, whether that's an original meaning of the word move forward. That is also used in the scriptures. Uh, philotic is a self type love. I guess this is different with the, the good one if there's a love of others than if you love for yourself. Maybe it doesn't be hell, so that's the type of love that's there. Pragma is a, a commitment love, like I love my work. Okay, and that's where we get our word pragmatic. Okay, and then mania is an obsessive type. Well, this is where God was the Dallas Cowboys. You know, I think this gives you more what you see when you watch Crimson Mountain. And we love a good type of thing. And then, last of all, the greatest love of all that it does is an unconditional, totally loving someone. So, we're going to look at uh, what John's talking about here. In these passages together. Any question or comment on the definition of law? Anybody have a sure fire ideas? Okay, here we go. All right. Mark, would you uh, read this passage? This is what you mean. This one here? Uh -huh. The new command I give you love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. And what is the Greek word that he's using here? Eros? No. Agape. Watch one. Agape. Okay. Remember, he said you've heard an old command in this scripture here, an old command of loving Philea. 
Okay. But I tell you a new command now I give you. All of us, when we're transformed into Christ, it's not the commitment of the God they love for others. Okay? Let's get into it a little bit deeper. All right, secondly, we're going to start reading from the scriptures now. We, we really take care of our young children and put limits for them to protect them from hurting themselves. And what's coming out is very powerful. We take our step on this death or our way to slip and we land on a big toe. Some kids did put it back together. So we, as we get older, we'll stumble. Okay, you can see it in your life. I see another great out there. You know, you know. Okay. John's concern here is that we might stumble walking around in the darkness. Uh, that is hatred for our brothers and sisters. And he goes on to say that hate causes us to lose our way. So not only can we stumble in life without a God that hate, we can lose our way and be lost in the darkness. Okay. Uh, let's have someone read first John 2 11. Why should you cut up, cut up your screen? Mm -hmm. uh, but anyone who hates a brother or sister is in the darkness and walks around in the darkness. They do not know where they're going because the darkness has blinded them. Okay. So he is going to me why we hate our brothers and sisters that we stumble and we lose our way. What's the working factors there? Do we tend to become obsessed? Well, hate is the opposite of love. Uh -huh. uh, darkness is the opposite of light. Like, this whole book kind of deals with the opposite. Uh -huh. and so I think when you're in a hateful state, you're in darkness and you're going to come. Absolutely. Absolutely. And when you're in a hateful state, you begin to be obsessed with that hatred. It becomes to be dominant in your driving force in your life. And it shuts out the light or it shuts out the ability to love. So, uh, that's a motivating factor that, that works here, Phil. You know? Another part of that opposite is when you're in agape love, you're seeking the best from someone, you're seeking to help out and serve. When you hate someone, all you want is to harm them or to ignore them. You're just, you, know, you don't see what is needed. You see, from your standpoint, of your own emotions. Okay. The statement made is if there's somebody that you hate or despise or do not like, start praying for them. Okay. It's hard to pray for someone that you hate. Eventually, that hate will dissolve away. Another comment? I think what we have more in our society today is necessarily active hate, but attitude, which is the yeah, someone, I've heard someone say, what's the opposite of love? Somebody said hate, and then they said, no, it's apathy. Okay. I didn't get into that too much, okay, but it, it is true. Okay. Uh, then he goes into what our blessing that we have in this agape. How are we blessed? Uh, let's say, Paul, can you go to the Bible one from there to the scripture? Read First John 12, 2, 12, 2, 12. One of the blessings that we have in the gospel is that we are forgiven of our sins. Another one, uh, verse number 13, of the Bible up here. We read verse 13. I write unto you, Father, because ye have known him that is from the beginning. I write unto you, young men, because ye have overcome the wicked one. I write unto you, little children, because ye have known the Father. Okay, very good. Who's the evil one he's talking about here? Satan. Satan, okay. You can see today in this world how Satan is walking around winning battle after battle after battle. And it stunned me because we lost our ability to love one another. 
So we overcome the devil if our life is filled with agape. Okay. And then I we think you went ahead, Denise, read 14, the time read 14 for us. I have written unto you, Father, because you have known him that is from the beginning. I have written unto you, young men, because you are strong and word of love by him. And you have overcome the wicked. Okay. Word of God abides in you. Okay. Uh, how can we ensure that the word of God does abide in us? Study it, know it. All right, study it. Okay. Constantly be into the word because without knowing the word, there's no way that it can abide in you. And in that abiding, it helps you make decisions in life. When you come across some situation, you will reflect on what you know from the word, and the word will help you. And then the last one, I think we've already read this one, it helps us to know the Father, okay? I know a lot of people, but I don't think that's what John's talking about here. What do you think John's talking about here? Do we know John? Do we know what kind of knowing is he referring to? Anybody want to get involved in that? It's an understanding. Okay. It's more intimate. Okay. Relationship we have with God. I think I know about a tremendous amount of people. I know on the surface a lot of people, but I know flesh, trust me, okay? You know your wives and your husbands. I know Herky, we spend enough time together. I know Paul because I have lived with him and shared with them the word, okay? And I think this is what John's saying here, that if we have a agape, we're going to be so close to the word that God is going to be an intimate relationship. Is that a fair statement? Let me see a few heads shaking out there, okay? Uh, this is important because we'll know God and Jesus the more we're in this world, and they will be driving the lives and be an example to us. Comment? This is a key point that John is trying to make to us here. Right? Okay. Okay. 15, maybe 20 years ago, there was a big thing going on with the yellow bracelet that said WWJD. That's what we used to do. Made that kind of set off. Mm -hmm. But you got to know Jesus. Yeah. You know, <laughs> you know what he would do. Right? Know what to do there. Good point. Okay, Mark. Thank you. All right. All right. Do not love the world. That's 15 through 17. Uh, can I get someone to read those two verses, three verses? Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. Man that serves the world, the love of the Father, is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but the love of the world. Okay. Up to this point, what uh, word has John been using? Oh, God, don't let me know. Well, love. Agape, yes. He's been talking about agape. All of a sudden, he changes and he's talking now about what? Oh, we need to go back to the first of the lessons. <laughs> okay. Eros. Okay. Eros, our, our sensual side of love. Uh, he's really talking about the world, spiritual situation. In my lifetime, guys, I have to admit that I've seen a lot of degradation. Okay? Just in the, the few years I have lived. It's basically defined by sin. Uh, where I see that is the people who believe in homosexuality and same sex marriage and so on and so forth attack us because they think we hate because of our convictions. And, they kind of turn the table and the definitions have changed 
And the church looks bad because it stands up for what it believes in. It's what's happening in the world today. Under the power of the evil one, it's in verse 19. I'm going to go ahead and read 19. It's outside of our scripture today. And we know that we are all God. And the whole world lies in wickedness. I'm sorry, Denise, I'm at chapter five. That is five. Uh, and we know that we are of God, and the whole world lies L I E G H in wickedness. Okay. So the world is under the control of Satan. All it's got to do is look around us and see what's happening. Okay. The people around us are rejecting God. They have failed to his will. Uh, they're driven by desire. Okay. The lust of the eyes. And the first one doesn't get us too badly, but the second one there does. A possession seems to uh, control us quite a bit. But I'm not sure you fully understand this concept unless you've gone outside to a third world country and you see people that don't have anything and don't know what to do. We understand this thing. And you see their motivation and their attitudes and their beliefs. Sometimes we allow our possessions or the things that we have to become something that or interfere with. Our relationships with each other. Any problem with that? Anyone? Anyone else go to a third world country and realize how this works? Okay, good. Okay, in condition, the desires of this world, our possessions, everything that we have, uh, everything that we gain, everything that we do is going to pass away. But the agape of God will never pass away. It will always be there. What boat should we get on? Eros or agape? I haven't read the book since this world is here. That was the question. How should we be motivated to work with agape or Eros? Good, thank you. All right, here are some basic conclusions that we gain from, from this study. Okay? First of all, hatred and indifference are completely out of place. That's good. In fact, Mark? Sure, well, I, I just want to, before we wrap it up, I want to be sure to make the point that I think that, and you already said, the world has defined hatred as, as uh, if you don't agree with me, you hate me. That's certainly not what. Christians intend when we point out that we believe that they are based on our worldview. But I've seen it creeping into Christians using the same corrupt way of accusing people of hate when they don't agree with them. And I think we need to be very careful about that. I think when the word setting up change, it's probably almost as appropriate as the word setting up love to understand it's certainly not disagreement or pointing out error. In our view, that's that's really love is to point out someone's error before they you know, you know live their life in disobedience to God. Mm -hmm. And uh, the concern is, is this seems to be generational, even within <coughs> in the church. The older ones of us okay, believe in our, our basic standards, we believe in the life of certain things are wrong and stand up for that. And then our younger members of the body of Christ are tending to think in a different direction and it, the right one is beginning to creep into the church quite a bit. Okay. And we just got to remember that uh, the, the premise that we use here is we hate the sin, but what? Love, love, love the sin. We got to show love and however we interact with individuals that uh, believe differently or try to turn the tide. Another comment, Mark, that's good to make that clear. I think, you know, one of the things I, I, I had to deal with, I had children, I wasn't, I wasn't in the church, you know, it was a problem. I did all that. I'm not on the way to God. 
Yeah, it's kind of feeling bad. You know, the Lord has not been Christian from the beginning. We've been a lot of good from my children, you know. Mm -hmm. And then you try to go back and just have them just yeah. You know, that time we done got into the world and it's hard, you know. Mm -hmm. It should be different. So not only does this happen in our relationships in the world, it's happening within the church, it's happening within our family, family, family. Mm -hmm. You can feel a little difference between the two of us. That's the call. Is that a comment before we walk out of the field because we get into our discussion? I read something the other day that disagreement isn't a bug, it's a feature, which in many ways it is. Opening of the door for a discussion about our type. That's enough for us. Moves us to love others. Is one thing that we say. Okay. In fact, this is the essence. Uh, I've said this many, many times. Uh, my mother was a checklist Christian. Okay, and she never developed from the teachers of the church. Because this teaching has only become prominent in my life or lifetime. But you, we, when I was growing up, I did things because I felt like I had to, and I felt like I had to do them to stay out of hell. And it wasn't brought into my attention later in my life that we love others because what? God said it's love for us, which okay, motivates us. Amen. All right. The third conclusion is we walk in hatred, we turn blind, and we will stumble and we will lose our way. Okay. Just keep in mind that when you've got hatred for someone, who is it destroying? It's destroying you. Okay. It's not destroying the other person. So it's something we want to make sure it doesn't happen in our life. Okay. Blessings of God causes us to part company with the world. Those three, four blessings that we saw a few moments ago causes us to separate ourselves from the world and then love the world to the point of being distracted from God. Coming on the conclusions we see from John's passage here. All right, it's your turn to start off. Why does not love and others cause us to be blind? We've mentioned physical things. We're in darkness and we're not loving others. Or absolutely. We can't see it. That hatred just overwhelms our ability to see the spiritual essence of our love. That's true. We're in darkness when we don't love others. Why is love like light and hate like darkness? Because when we're because hate is the darkness and and darkness causes us to stumble. And when we stumble, the light and the light and light causes you and in the darkness is what causes us to stumble. And, and and we have to walk in light, but if you're in darkness, you stumble. And that's why. Well, that behooves us to make sure. You don't know, want to be in darkness, so you will stumble. But the darkness, you do stumble. Anybody that's in darkness stumbles. It behooves us to do everything possible. Person, for a system, a hatred for an official, whatever that hatred might be, that we would work as much as we can to get that hatred out of the law so we can see clearly. Fair conclusion, man. All right, I'm not going to touch this one. What do you think? For you, as you were saying earlier, love, love the sinner, hate sin, you know, maybe you can really limit your hate to specific actions, not, not really. 
The hateful, <clears throat> hateful is an attitude. I don't think the Christians have ever justified being hateful. You might hate the sin, but you're not hateful about it. That's an attitude that puts you in darkness in the heartbeat. But you just pull out the one little phrase out of one little verse that says, love what is good and hate what is bad. And that's what I'm doing. I'm hating what's evil. And you're the one who's evil. And that's it. Yep. I think hate was more about action than, you know, like the sense. But hate for it, I think, is to take some action towards it. As a Christian, And, you know, from an audience standpoint, I mean, Jews that were there in the, the temple the day that Jesus cleared it would have thought he'd be an atheist. Yeah. You know, I mean, he wasn't being he wasn't being accepting of all the things that they were doing wrong. And you know, I'm sure they walked around and thought how you know how evil he was and how hateful he was. Good point. Good point. Okay, let's take the next one. How can material wealth cause us to walk in the pride of life? I mean, this is what it means to have a lot of Mind off of walking in the light. Make you think you're self sufficient. Don't be God. The distraction. Make you think you're better than other people. You need to find that problem in the It might make you not upset because everything is possible to me. You try not to forget about the need for other practices and other people. You have no need to come close. A lot of those people get protective of their wealth yeah. and they want to grow it, but not necessarily get it. Well, they think I'm working hard for what I have. Why can't they work hard for to have what they need? Mm -hmm. You know, it turns it, it turns your focus away. But Jesus says you can't serve two masters. Mm -hmm. And this whole section is about which master are you going to choose? Because it's back in verse 15 when he says, Don't love the world, he uses the word of God in the church. He's saying you can't be really a giver, a server of others unconditionally if you unconditionally give yourself to the world because that's what you're going to focus on and end up that's what you're going to worship. Because you can't say that you love God and love the world. It, it brings out things like saying, Thank you, God, for not making me like them. <laughs> <laughs> You're right, it's yeah. very, very insightful. No, 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 no. Let me that time I didn't hear it. It says, makes you say, Thank you, God, for not making me like that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, and last one, that is 217. Have you changed your focus about the things of this life? Someone read the last post for us. Lust is passing away, but the one who does the will of God remains forever. What kind of one do you want? Our focus. If we wish to live for God, we should have. Closing comment, please. I be here this morning studying the love and spiritual love, being with all of us, and apply what's been taught today, discussed in the hearts. Uh, uh, we are so
Sure. Yeah, I left it up here when I came up here with the remote. Okay. 